Hello. Hi, Hi everyone. everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our first uh, inaugural speaker series. Um, well, I don't know what the word is for the bi-weekly inaugural, but anyway, uh, here we are. <laughs> uh, we're going to do this every other Sunday. Uh, we're going to bring on um, an expert in the field to talk about uh, a specific part of the tabletop industry and their experience with it and how it might be able to help you. Um, it's going to be super great. And today, uh, for our first one, we have a overview of the tabletop industry, uh, the life of a game, how it goes from idea to being published to on the store shelves and how everyone loves it uh, by someone who is truly uh, a renaissance person, has done everything in the industry, uh, you name it. It's the perfect person to talk about this. Uh, my buddy, my friend, uh, Matt Fantastic. Uh, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, everybody! Uh, happy to be here. Um, so, so to just just to correct, like really quick, there are some roles that I have not had. Uh, I've never uh, done. Uh, I've never worked for a logistics company. I've never uh, worked for a distributor. Um, sure. And sure. Uh, and some of my experience with some other stuff is like somewhat more minimal than uh than i would say full expert but enough to talk about it for everybody so uh yeah so really quick i primarily work as a game designer now um, i teach game design at university level i also own or co-own a game store slash uh big game club house library thing um i also publish games uh both completely myself and with some uh companies that i i do I uh, work for as like a creative director or something. So so those are the places that I have the most experience. Um, but I also have worked in manufacturing as a print broker for a bit. Um, I've done, uh, because of the publishing, I've done lots of sort of things in the marketing and sales space, even though that's not necessarily my core skill set. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to run down uh, what is a massive process uh, in as quick a period of time as possible. Um, I'm going to try to not go off on tangents too much. And also, as Mike said, we want to make sure that we're thinking about the context of what this talk is. This is not a talk about how to be a better designer, although I'm happy to talk to you about that. I think the mentorship program has uh, perhaps an, not an overrepresentation, but I think the majority of people here are interested in design and or self-publishing, especially. Um, so I'll maybe spend a little bit more time on that, but overall, this is meant to give you a broad overview. You know, you want to design games, you want to get into it. Like, here's what happens. Here are the different roles that can happen. Here are the different steps that games go through to get from an idea to an actual finished product that is being sold and people are buying. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, one other, uh, sort of like asterisk that I'm going to bring up is that a uh, my advice and overview is certainly not the be all end all there are lots of people that are way smarter than me that will talk about this stuff there's lots of other sources of information whether it's talking to your mentor um, or you know just looking around online i will caution people though that uh, you want to think about the context of the advice that's being given that is you know somebody who is maybe very successful at doing this one slice of pie um, and not necessarily something that jives with what you want to do. Um, there's a lot of advice about how to do a Kickstarter or, oh, don't ever do this type of game or, you know, blah, 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 this, this, this is wrong. Anyone who tells you that they're hundred percent right is completely wrong, first of all. And second of all, um, you know, you may read really wonderful advice for how to run uh, small Euro Kickstarters and you may look at them as a very successful company um, and not to denigrate some of this stuff in any way. Everyone, I think everyone's a good designer that wants to be, everybody's a publisher that has made a thing, you know, but at the same time, think about the goals of that publisher and what they're trying to do with their games or that designer, what they're trying to do with their games and think about what you're trying to do. Uh, the approach you're gonna take to be a self-published, very niche hobby designer and publisher versus I wanna make huge party games for Hasbro. Um, those are both super valid paths. Those are both super interesting things and there's no wrong or right answer, but just, you know, make sure that the advice you're getting and the information you're getting, you're a double, triple, quadruple checking other sources and b thinking about where it's coming from, their experience level, the slice of the pie that they're going after, you know, all these things, right? So just make sure that when you're looking at this, you're coming in and, and just absorbing as much information as possible and there are no hard rules, fast rules, no anything like that. So thank you for saying that, you know, like all this stuff, you know, it's 
none of it is a the hard and fast rule. None of it's dog, right? There is no board game dogma for anything. Uh, it's all about how it works for you. And, and maybe you have fresh ideas that are just better. You're going to take all this information. You're going to turn it into something that works for you and nobody else. And you're going to be super successful at it. Because um, success is something you decide, decide for yourself exactly. what that means. Exactly. Yeah, Grace, that is like the truest thing. That like that right there is the biggest thing, right? Like you decide if you're having a good time. You decide if you're successful. You decide if you're a game designer, right? Like, yeah, I'm doing the thing. Great. I'm having a wonderful time. You know, I, I talk a lot about uh, the context of uh, music and that you have people that just want to hang out, play music with themselves, whatever. Then you have, you know, people that are like, hey, we're happy just being a bar band. We want to go play covers. We're going to have a good time. Then there's, you know, sort of like that middle DIY kind of tier of, you know, like we're serious, but we're not aiming to be on the radio or whatever. But, you know, we're touring. Maybe we're part of a niche. We're like a free jazz combo or, you know, punk band or whatever. And then you have, you know, the huge, big stadium, you know, get on the radio, all this kind of stuff. And each of those, there are people that do all of those things and are completely satisfied, completely happy with where they are. Um, so, yeah, thinking about where it is you want to be and what it is you want to do is perhaps actually uh, the first step of this, right, is, is identifying what excites you, identifying where you think you want to fall into this. Um, that can be a trial and error process. Absolutely. Um, I know a lot of designers now that started, uh, you know, a, a good number of years ago with self-publishing a Kickstarter. And then we're like, oh, like, this is a nightmare. I do, what am I doing? I have no interest in doing all of this. I 100% just want to be a designer, not a publisher, um, you know, and vice versa. So, you know, try the things, right? There's no, uh, you know, be cautious about getting yourself in over your head in terms of like, oh, I'm on the hook for all this money, you know, because I did a thing or whatever. But but overall, you know, try, fail, try, right? Like just, you know, get in there, start doing stuff and see what happens. So that's step one uh, or step zero. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, right. in the process, well, oh, go ahead. Uh, before we get to step one, I'm just going to say uh, uh, after the talk, uh, after Matt speaks, we're going to have a and a So if you have any questions uh, during it, uh, save them for the end or put them in the chat and then we'll, we'll get them to Matt. Um, but make sure you keep them sort of broad. Um, you know, this is not the time to ask about your specific project and how to do that. But maybe, you know, um, your, your first time. We, I know we have a lot of first timers in the program. Um, so if you just like, you have no idea where to get started, you know, this talk's going to cover a lot of that. And, and if not, you can always just ask those kinds of questions. Um, so we will uh, let you go. Uh, to get started with step one, now that we've covered step zero, uh, and take it away, Matt. All right, awesome. So the first thing <clears throat> that's going to happen is that we are going to have an idea. Someone's going to have an idea, right? Um, but, you know, we have to think about the different paths that that idea may take, right? So usually what you're going to be doing is <clears throat> thinking about a space, a gap in the market um, that you are looking to fill, right? So there's sort of three different paths that I think that primarily is driven by one is just purely creative, right? I have this great idea. I want to make a game that does this. I want to make a game that does that. I really want to, you know, just creatively explore something that I think is really interesting. And that's what's going to make me do it. Uh, then you have sort of a, a market gap in terms of the design where you're like, well, I really like X game, but I think it could do better. I think that we're really lacking a game that uh, meets this need, you know, you're looking at, at the market from a creative standpoint and looking to fill that gap in some way. Um, then the third is from a more pure business standpoint, I think that there is a space for a company that does this. I think I can sell a lot of this. I think I can make this and be very successful. Um, something that I think us as creatives like to do a lot is look down on the business side of things. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with being an absolute purist. I, some of the games I self publish, I do specifically because uh, not a lot of people want to uh, publish a single sheet of paper that you rip up in the process of playing it. That is a really sad game about divorce. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're, doing stuff like that but then there's also things where you're like you know i really think that the market could do with a game like this there's a real opportunity there's a real space so one of the first steps is you know thinking about what it is that you want to try to make um then you're just going to kind of ideate on that you're going to have a bunch of ideas something that i personally do as a designer is i come up with a concept a day um obviously there are some days that i miss here and there and then there's days where i have more um but I just keep a journal where I write an idea a day. So at the end of the year, I have, you know, 400 ideas and, you know, maybe 
five of them may end up getting published. Um, and again, these are just, you know, it's just to keep that creative mind uh, flowing, right? Something that I started doing is anytime we have something, some conversation that's fun or funny or we're having it, it's like, oh, okay, can we take this and turn it into a game, right? Um, similarly, when you're approaching a design at this concept stage, but also when we step into that, uh, the next step of design, um, there's sort of, again, three sort of primary ways of approaching a concept or a design. One is a theme. I want to make a game about aliens fighting wizards in the 1940s. Great. Okay. And then you have to figure out what that game is. Um, another is uh, mechanical, right? I want to make a deck builder, but it has a bidding mechanic and a dexterity component, right? So th there's a mechanical approach. And then there's the third, which kind of blends a lot of this together, is an experiential design. So here's what I want people to be doing when they're playing the game. Here's kind of the thought process I want them to have. Here's the type of experience I want them to have. Is this going to be a funny thing? Is this going to be a serious thing? You know. Uh, so again, we're thinking about these different elements and approaches to design. Um, once we have a concept that we feel good about, we're going to start moving on to the design process itself. Um, so I think at this stage, what's going to happen is as quickly as possible, you are going to take that idea and turn it into a thing. Uh, ideas are cheap. As I mentioned, I have literally hundreds of them. Um, and who cares, right? Until I have something on the table, until I made a thing, I don't have anything. So in that design step, designers are trying to get whatever it is onto the table as quick as possible. You want to get the thing done, you get it out there, then you've actually started designing. You want to see how it works, move pieces around, just take a marker and some note cards, write some stuff down, make it happen. Rip pieces out of other games. I have a prototype right now that features pieces from Catan, uh, Twilight Imperium, uh, Game of Thrones, the board game, uh, you know, a bunch of different stuff and it's like all smashed together to make this prototype. Um, get something done. Uh, it's also, also PS, I'm talking really fast uh, because I'm trying to get this done in a reasonable time frame. So apologies if I'm just kind of, uh, <clears throat> we get into play testing. Play testing is really the heart of design. It's where you're going to spend the most time if you are a game designer. And that is trying the game out as much as possible. You're going to have an early alpha stage where you're just, I don't know, does this work at all? Then you're going to get into sort of a closed beta stage where you have a thing that works decently well, and you're going to start playing that with other people in your circle. Perhaps you're part of a playtesting group. Um, we think those are those are wonderful. If there's not a playtest, you know, look around. There's probably a playtesting group somewhere near you. And if there's not, find one other person who's a designer in the area, and now you have a playtest group. Great. So you're going to start getting together, trying out each other's games. Uh, Obviously, there's a little asterisk here that in a time of COVID, this is pretty much all remote. Um, so there are a number of excellent online playtest groups that people can get involved with that are going to be able to uh, play through your games, you know, uh, talk to other designers, talk to other creatives. You're going to have people on there that are just interested in playtesting. They don't even care about design. Um, one thing that I will mention about that is that the compensation associated with playtesting is a very weird thing, uh, very complicated at this point you know, sort of uh, stage in uh, the process and also just the industry as a whole, right? So if we were asking people to test accounting software, we would probably be paying them. Um, however, in game design, you know, you're kind of having fun. Some people are excited. Some people are, you know, doing these things. So we just want to make sure that what it is, if we're participating in one of these communities, is that we're putting in more than we're taking out right? Whether that's as a publisher, as a designer, as whatever. We want to give more than we get. We want to be generous. We want to be able to, when it's time for us to say, hey, who wants to try this thing out? We want a bunch of people that we've already helped out to say, oh, awesome. Absolutely. Totally in. Um, and that's how we really build this community. That's how you really are going to find the most successful communities are. Um, in terms of groups, uh, I see James in the chat mentioned a few. Um, you know, you're going to have Zoom, Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia are going to be the primary vehicles for that remote playtesting. Um, and then maybe uh, we will throw some notes. Uh, maybe we'll do some notes with this and uh, toss in a few Discord communities. But I think, you know, Tabletop Mentorship Program Discord is an excellent place to start building this and uh, getting involved in some of the remote playtesting. So we've play tested a game. We feel really good about it. When do we feel done with that game? Well, the answer is going to be variable depending on the design, depending on the designer, depending on your plan for the next stage of the game. But ultimately, 
What I look for is there have not been any major changes, um, especially to the core mechanics for a good amount of time or play tests. Um, and that means that, you know, I'm not worried about, well, I don't know if, if an auction is actually the right way to do this. Well, then you're still very much in that design process. But if you're worried about, well, the costing on this, you know, is this, should this be a three? Should this be a four? I don't know. Should this be 54 cards? Do I want to up it a little bit more? Do I want to think about, you know, changing it? That stuff is where we're going to start moving into in the tabletop realm, what we think of as development. Um, so a really important note here is that in the digital space, uh, designer developer is a much more interchangeable, fuzzy uh, place. Uh, especially because in digital, you're going to end up with much more specialized roles, uh, especially at that larger scale. You know, you're going to have teams of 100 plus people. So everybody's doing these very distinct roles. But developer is kind of a, a broad uh, bucket there. When we're talking about it in tabletop, what we're typically talking about is the person who's going to take a design and kind of kick it over the finish line. Right. They're going to be doing stuff like worrying about the math. They're going to be doing things where everything's working perfectly, but the way the economy is, it's just, we need to tweak that, right? It's taking, uh, the, the way I think of it when I get brought on to develop something, my first conversation that I have with people is, what do you want the game to be doing, right? What is it that you, you, you want to have happen in the game? What's the goal? And then my job as a developer is to help get the game there, to help realize that vision, to help make all of these wonderful ideas the designer had turn into something that does all that, right? Um, I want everybody to really just get into this bidding thing. I want everybody to, you know, really mix it up and, and they're not, right? Well, okay, so how do we tweak that part of the system to make it realize that vision? Um, so developing can get really interesting in that uh, it has a few different places that it may take place. Um, so, Sometimes you're going to do some development. You might work with a developer as a designer who is then looking to pitch your game. Uh, I caution against that in general because usually the developer is going to be uh, associated with the publisher. The people that hire me the most are publishers uh, for development jobs. Um, publishers are going to know what they want to have happen. They're going to take their own spin on that vision usually. And they're going to have a better idea. They're also going to have a budget. Um, development frequently costs money. And, you know, if you're just a designer hoping to get a game signed, maybe you want to wait until, uh, you know, you get it signed before you start spending more money on it. Um, one thing to keep in mind is this uh, dual role where you may be a designer and developer on your own work. Um, it's not something that you should not do just as a rule, but it is also something that is really dangerous and you can really, you know, get yourself lost in your own design. You've put so much time and effort into playing this game to this point that some things that feel obvious to you may not feel obvious to anyone else. Um, <clears throat> you're frequently going to get caught up in some passionate element that you would just, I love this thing. I love this thing. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it, maybe it isn't great. Maybe it's not working the way it should. Um, so having that kind of dual uh, role situation with another person can frequently lead to the best work. Um, but again, you know, not a hard and fast rule, not something that, that you can't, uh, you know, do yourself. So let's say we have this great game. We've done this. And now we are moving on to the publishing stage. So publishers, there are a few different ways that publishers are going to get games. Um, so one is that they are going to develop them internally. So a lot of publishers, especially the larger ones, or self-publishers are going to make a game themselves and then they're going to publish it. Um, you also have did, uh, pitches. So I made a game. I'm going to go pitch it to a bunch of publishers. Here's my game. Do you want to publish it? Um, and then the third, and this is less common, um, and especially if you're getting started in the industry, this is going to be very uncommon, um, is the publisher will reach out to you and say, hey, we want you to make this. Uh, and then you will get contracted to make that game. Uh, that can take multiple forms. Sometimes it'll just be, hey, we're looking to do this thing, throw some concepts our way just really early on. You know, what do you think? Give me some stuff. Yeah, we like that. We'll make that. Um, other times it's just, you know, from the get go, hey, we want to hire you to make this game. Here you go, make this game. Um, again, that's something that you know I do a fair bit of. I'm trying to do a lot more of, uh, but is not going to happen a ton if you're if you're just getting started. But it's definitely something to uh, 
work up to if you're interested in that. Um, it's also a great way to end up with licenses um, because frequently if you design for a license, you're going to be limited in that you can only talk to the people that have that license. Um, whereas if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I want you to make this game uh, with Disney or with you know Marvel or with any of these other you know huge licenses, um, you know that it's going to happen. Um, so uh, let's breeze through this because this is, you know, pitching is a whole thing. There's probably actually going to be a whole talk on pitching. I know a lot of people are interested in pitching. There's a whole lot of things in terms of what people want to see if you are pitching, what you want to look for if you're getting pitched. Um, I will, I will, you know, slightly off topic, uh, rant for a moment about sell sheets. Uh, this is a thing that I argue about all the time with other designers uh, and other people in the mentor space. So absolutely do not take my word for it. But I think the idea that you need sell sheets as a rule is not a good one. Um, I think that they serve a role and they can be useful. And depending on what your goals are, you know, it helps to have something you can give people. But at the end of the day, the likelihood that you are also an excellent graphic designer and marketing person and a designer is not super high. Um, and the quality of your design has nothing to do with your ability to generate marketing documents. So <clears throat> it is frequently being used now uh, as this kind of conventional wisdom that has existed in this parroted echo chamber. Um, and it's not necessarily the way that a lot of publishers operate. Um, there are certainly some that do, but especially when you get uh, up out of uh, some of the smaller startup publishers, you're gonna see that uh, less and less. Although there's some big publishers that absolutely love it, um, but really my problem with it is that they are, are not overlapping skill sets necessarily. And so I caution you to spend a lot of time, to not spend a lot of time working on sell sheets, worrying about sell sheets, worry about making an excellent game if you're a designer looking to uh, pitch it. Uh, again, there are a few different ways that this is happening, especially now in the age of COVID. But, you know, one is the cold approach. You're just going to email somebody. You're going to call somebody. You're going to walk up to their booth at a convention. That's going to be the least successful. Um, the other major one now, especially, is people are going to put out a call for pitches. They may participate in a pitch event. Um, a pitch event will get you in front of a lot of people. Uh, there's all kinds of different tiers in pitch events. There's different uh, goals, you know, but keep an eye out for those. Um, and despite them uh, having an emphasis on sell sheets, I will uh, heartily recommend um, the pitch project uh, that my friend Sen uh, runs along with, uh, I think, Jay. And, uh, you know, it's great. Talk to those guys. They're super smart. They, they know what they're doing very well. Um, so pitching going to be all over the place. Uh, so let's say that a publisher has decided that they like a game. So now you're going to move on to a contracting phase. Um, oh, assessment. Sorry, skipped a step here. Publishers, even if they like a game, are going to go through a period of assessment. They're going to spend time play testing the game. They're going to spend time looking at the game. They're going to spend time thinking about how that game is going to fit into their uh catalog and the market that they are trying to sell to. Uh, something that happens a whole lot is that you're going to have people that are going to say, man, this game is awesome, but like, I'm not going to be able to sell it. This doesn't fit with what we're doing. Or, oh man, this is a really great dice game, but we have a dice game that we're going to be releasing in the next year. And obviously we don't really want to put a competing dice game on the market at the same time. So, you know, ah, you know, we love this. It's not for us. So frequently uh, a game not getting picked up has nothing to do with the quality of the design. Um, there are a handful of games, period, that I think are standalone good enough designs in a vacuum that no matter what, the publisher should sign it and should have signed it. And oh my God, like if you passed on this, you were wrong. Um, but there's a lot of assessment that goes into the decision to make a game because deciding to make a game is frequently a very expensive and effortful uh, task. So there's going to be a significant amount of time that that may take. Uh, frequently, a publisher will take months to assess a game uh, because they're thinking about all the stuff that they have immediately. Uh, I can say right now, a lot of publishers I'm talking to uh, about designs that are new that they're looking to take on are looking for a 2022 uh, release date. And this is September 2020. So you can see that a lot of publishers are looking anywhere from six to 18 months out, I would say is kind of the standard for when they may want to publish a game. And I'd say six is definitely at that shorter end of it. So 
people are looking at something that they want to sell. How many publishers are publishing how many games this year, right? They're really looking at a game from all dimensions, not just purely from a design perspective. So let's say that publisher has decided you want to publish a game. You're a publisher, you're a designer, whatever. You're going to want to go through a contracting process. And this is, again, uh, a complicated, oh man, I forgot one more thing about pitching that people always ask about and has been coming up a lot lately. And that is the role of agents. So there are agents in the game industry, just like any other industry with agents, there are absolute crooks that are going to take a bunch of money to screw you over. Um, the best advice I can give about agents is to ask people about it. Ask what games they have landed, what games they have landed where, look at their portfolio of things, talk about who they are pitching to, talk about what their background is in that space, uh, because that's going to tell you a lot about it. Um, and feel free to ask either in the mentorship chat or some of the other public design groups and look for people that have experience with this to give advice. Um, one thing that does come up is a fee to assess your game. Uh, that is not an automatic red flag. That can be a red flag, but it's not automatic. Some of the best agents in the industry do charge a little bit of money to assess a game if they want to take it on. And the reason for that is how many thousands of game designers are hitting them up, asking them to sign, you know, take on my game, please. I, I made the next greatest game. Uh, so many people are going to say that and they need to um, prioritize their time. There's only so many hours in the day. Um, and some of these people are showing up to New York Toy Fair with a few dozen games that they're pitching, but they are pitching them to you know Hasbro, Mattel, Spin Master, all these huge companies. So agents are frequently the only way you're gonna get access to some of these companies or the most likely path to get access to some of these companies. So agents play an important role. Um, it is somewhat more limited in the uh, hobby side of things, but absolutely it is an interesting angle. If you're a publisher, talk to agents that might be able to filter games that you're interested in. If you're a designer, think about the value an agent might bring to what you're trying to do here. Uh, so contracts, this isn't super exciting, but the basic answer is if you are a publisher, talk to a lawyer, uh, but make sure that you talk to a lawyer who has experience in board games specifically. Um, because there are a lot of lawyers that have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, IP law, as it relates to tabletop gaming, is very weird and very fuzzy. And the really short answer is that you cannot copyright a game mechanic. You can copyright the specific written expression of that rules. You can copyright, obviously, all the art, all the, you know, all the things like that. But you can't actually copyright this is the pattern of play like Cards Against Humanity is literally apples to apples. And there wasn't really too much they could do about it. You have trade dress, you have a trademark, you have a variety of ways that you can create protectable IP. Um, you also have at a very rare end of the spectrum, a patent potentially, but that typically is reserved for anything that is a mechanical innovation, not necessarily sort of like traditional game design. It is, oh, we created a unique way to interact with this thing and it is unique and specific enough that it is worth a patent but generally speaking don't worry about patents um publishers are typically going to have a standard contract um you can certainly talk to them about it if you are a designer um if you are a publisher be open to what designers are talking about but really it's going to follow this same basic form um I personally try to sign contracts that look like the contracts that I have other people sign. Um, I personally prefer more plain language. I personally prefer a shorter contract. Really, ultimately, at the end of the day, the role of a contract in 99% of the time is it is a wonderful opportunity for everyone involved in the process to talk about their expectations, to talk about the way things are going to work. Um, there's not one size fits all in terms of compensation. Uh, you may play, you may pay a flat fee to own the thing. You may pay royalties. You may pay royalties in a variety of different structures. Um, it's not that there is ever a right answer. If you feel good about it, the publisher feels good about it, then, or rather the designer feels good about it, the publisher feels good about it, like then, then everybody should feel good about it. Um, talk to other people about uh, what they look for in a contract. Um, I can again uh, suggest uh, my buddy Sen has a wonderful sort of little overview checklist of things designers should be worried about. But at the same time, if you're a publisher, those are the things that you should also be thinking about. But really, this is a way that you're going to discuss things like what is the actual number royalties are going to get paid off of? 
how are you calculating that, right? Is what is included in that calculation? How is that calculation being done? Now we have talked about it. We've talked about it at great detail. We are all on the same page because if you go into it expecting to need to use a contract, then you probably shouldn't work with whoever that person is. Um, never think about it in terms of, well, if we sue each other, blah, blah, blah. Don't do that. Go in expecting that something might not go well, but really go in expecting things to go well and expecting things to be just, yep, we're just talking out the details. We're figuring it out. Um, I will say that a huge red flag for publishers is people, designers coming in, oh, an NDA, I need this, I need that. Not to say that this, you should ever completely 100% never do things like this, but it's definitely a red flag if somebody wants me to sign an NDA to take a look at their game. Because frankly, your idea is probably not that good. Your idea is not that valuable. Um, somebody else has had it. Tons of people are parallel designing all kinds of really similar things. So, you know, be cautious in the way that you're approaching the legal side of things from uh, both directions. This more than ever uh, does include the importance of looking at the context of any advice you're getting, um, both uh, especially online, uh, because people online are not lawyers. They're going to have these ideas, this and that. Look for broad strokes. These are the things I look for in a contract. What's the sunset clause, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. But don't read people on the internet as legal advice. Similarly, like I said, talk to a lawyer, but make sure that that lawyer is well-versed in the industry that you are actually operating in because there are all kinds of weird little elements that they need to be aware of. Um, oh my God, time is flying here. Uh, so visual design. <laughs> Someone at this stage is going to uh, start making visual assets for the game. Once you have signed the game, you're doing the thing. Some of this stuff is going to be happening in parallel. So I'm going to talk about a couple things that are kind of happening at the same time. So development uh, with a publisher may be happening the same time as this visual design element. Um, but there's typically going to be three kind of primary roles. Um, one is going to be illustration. So that's going to be any art generation, character design, things like that. You're going to have graphic design, which is typically going to be, you know, text layout, uh, card frames, all that kind of stuff. It's not really illustration. And then in some uh, ways, and this is typically going to be covered by a graphic designer at a smaller scale, you're going to have somebody really focused on the uh, user interface, user experience aspect. So a lot of graphic designers are going to cover this as well, but this is also sort of a distinct thing because if I can make a beautiful card frame, that's great. If I can lay out text, that's great. But, you know, I'm thinking about maybe the way that I'm presenting this information on a player map, for example. What is the best way to present this information? Um, frequently, the UI, UX side of things can be the difference between a game being like super intuitive, easy to play, and the game being an absolute nightmare. So it's super important that uh, publishers are looking at the way this information is presented. Um, Similar to this uh, with a uh, designer, you can get uh, artists will have deals that may be royalties, they may be work for hire. Um, I personally am of a mind that uh, royalties are always a good thing. Um, we should always be sharing profit when we are extra successful. We should be paying people with a minimum guarantee, which is an important thing, um, so that you did this work, you're going to get some amount of money. But, you know, hey, we did great. Like, why should the artist not make extra money for, for doing something that's wonderful, which I think, again, this is an opinion, but visual design is frequently just as important as game design. If you make a wonderful game as a design and it looks like garbage, well, it's not gonna sell, people aren't gonna like it, it's not gonna do anywhere near as well as it could. However, if you make a gorgeous, beautiful game and the game is, you know, it's okay, it's pretty fun, but I have this rich experience because of the, the visual design elements, maybe the narrative elements, things like that, then you know that can be really really successful. So visual design and uh, non you know purely game design systems design roles really work together and are really what makes a game sing. Um, how are artists hired? So if you're an artist looking to get work, you can post in some groups. Uh, I suggest having a portfolio. Uh, I suggest getting. Uh, some work under your belt that can be projects that you're doing just as a redesign of a game that you know and like um, just create assets be very 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 cautious about doing work for exposure um, that is typically terrible um, it's typically a very exploitive relationship 
Um, it's, in my opinion, better to do mock-up work where you're doing fake work for like redesigning a game or something like that than to do free work for somebody who is publishing a game. If they are going to publish a game and don't want to give you money, maybe that money is royalties down the line. Maybe it's not something up front necessarily, but absolutely like really just don't do work for free. Um, value, value what it is you're doing. And if someone is going to devalue what it is that you're doing, then they are devaluing your whole relationship with them. And, and that's, you know, not good. Oh, I can't afford to make this game and pay you. Well, then you can't afford to make this game, right? Full stop. Um, now we're going to move on to making the game itself. So let's say all of these steps have been gone through. You have this wonderful game. How do you actually take these ideas, these, these visual assets and make a physical product? Because in the tabletop space, the physical product is, you know, obviously fundamental to what it is that we are doing. So we are going to make the game. There are a few different uh, ways that manufacturing takes place. Uh, one is small scale, you know, whether it's print on demand or sort of a bespoke small scale production. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is mass production, and that is going to be approached uh, in different ways with different strengths and advantages. Although mass production is almost exclusively going to have a higher quality outside of really small run handmade kind of stuff where somebody's really like, you know, getting into it and potentially operating at a real craftsman uh, level, craftsperson level. Um, so let's say that we are going to print uh, on demand. We're going to do a small run. There are a few companies that I think do a pretty good job with this, um, depending on what you're looking for. Some companies are going to excel. Some companies are going to be more or less expensive. Sometimes you can do the legwork yourself and come up with a better deal and a better product. You're going to be the one that's going to hunt down um, box manufacturing. There's uh, companies that will print just cards, but not do boxes uh, of the style you want, you know, things like that. Um, so domestically, short run things are, are pretty straightforward. Um, but again, you want to look at samples, you want to look at uh, the quality of the work, you want to look at what they've done previously. This also is the same rule for mass production. Um, there are a lot of excellent mass production companies, both uh, in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. Um, the biggest, I would say, uh, <clears throat> use case, if you are in the US is printing in China. Um, so printing in China is simultaneously not really that scary, not really that complicated, and also somewhat terrifying, right? Um, because you can't really just go over the factory and you don't have the same level of legal protection necessarily because international uh, trade law is going to be so much more expensive and difficult and complicated than, uh, you know, getting involved in something with uh, someone in your local jurisdiction. Uh, but there are a number of companies that have a great track record, um, and those companies are uh, really, really wonderful to work with. They have entire uh, teams or people that work with uh, people in uh, English language markets, for example. Same thing in Europe, you know, you'll have people uh, who work with people in the English language or work with people in whatever, you know, uh, different languages. Um, there's some really excellent factories in Europe. Uh, some really solid factories in the US. But again, think about the strengths of what each factory has. Um, some factories are gonna be better at wood, for example. Some factories are gonna be better at plastic injection molding. Some factories are gonna be better at boxes. Um, there's a whole lot of different things that you're gonna be looking at. Um, something that's really important for people to understand in mass production that I think a lot of people don't is that it is very rare, almost non-existent, that a company is going to do everything in house. So let's say you are going to work with Longpack. Uh, Longpack owns a factory. They own a whole lot of equipment. They're really good at making uh, some stuff in house. Um, they're primarily going to be doing printed materials. So typically, the typical setup in China, if you're printing in China, is going to be you'll contract with a manufacturing company like Longpack or Panda. They have a factory uh, where they will produce some elements of it. Typically, they're going to be doing a lot of the printed components in-house, so boxes, cards, rule books, things like that. They are also going to be doing all the finishing. And so what finishing is, is taking all these components, putting them into a box, you know, collating all this stuff, shrink wrapping a box, 
putting them in cartons, putting those cartons onto a pallet, right? So they're going to do all of that putting together of games. But the thing is that factories are super specialized and the dice factory, you want to work with a factory, like making dice is a whole factory of its own, right? Making plastic injection molds are a whole factory of its own. Doing wood frequently a whole factory of its own. Some of these companies may own additional factories, but typically what they're going to be doing is sourcing these things. Uh, this is in a much bigger uh, sense than just game manufacturing. Part of why it is uh, very difficult to move manufacturing once a manufacturing center is established. So if we're looking at uh, China, for example, uh, the Shanghai area, Nantong, that, that general uh, space in the, the SECs, we don't need to get into that too much. Um, not only is this factory here, but within a, a relatively tight radius, you have all of these various component suppliers. So I need dice. Well, I know that within, you know, a, a, a relatively small distance, there's a bunch of factories that make dice, you know, and you think about something like an iPhone, right? Well, we can't just start an iPhone factory, right? We need to make all of this stuff. You know, an iPhone, there's dozens of factories involved in creating the various components that are then going to go through this larger factory. So uh, production is not typically done all by a company. Uh, companies, sometimes it's better now, um, but uh, and companies like Panda, Longpack, somebody that's like a really respectable one, they're not going to try to pretend like they do make everything in house. But anybody who is telling you that they do everything in house, unless it's, you know, just cards in a tuck box or something like that. Uh, I would, uh, that raises a red flag for me, you know, pay attention to it. Um, while you're going through this process, there's going to be a series of proofing steps where you're going to be going back and forth with the factory. They're going to send you digital files. They're going to send you uh, <coughs> some white box stuff. There's a whole lot of steps here, which again, I'm not going to get into great detail on, but you know, you want to make sure that you're communicating with the factory. The factory is going to be uh, showing you what they're doing, sending you samples. Sometimes they're going to be physical. Sometimes they're going to be digital. Different types of samples are going to be more or less useful at different times. Um, depending on the project, you may or may not need some of these samples. Uh, but any factory that's saying like, no, 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 just trust us, like that's that's terrible red flag, don't do that. Uh, similarly, even before you start working with a factory, you're going to want to get samples of products they've done in the past. Uh, any factory that won't send you some samples, I would be like, I would probably just write them off completely. Um, working backwards because I jumped over a little bit here, the quoting process. So you're going to find a bunch of factories that you maybe want to work with. I suggest quoting with three to five factories minimum, um, especially thinking about both China, uh, European. There's a lot of great manufacturing going on in Poland right now, especially um, in Europe. And then, of course, you know, you have Ludof Ludofact uh, in Germany that does incredible work. Uh, and then domestically, there's a number of factories that you maybe want to talk to. Um, but again, different factories, different regions are going to have strengths and weaknesses. Um, to quote, you're going to develop something called an RFQ, which is a request for quote. You're going to have to specify all of the details of what it is that you want made. You can't just say, hey, I want cards. You have to say what size cards. Obviously, there's tarot cards, there's poker cards, there's bridge cards, there's mini cards, there's all these different sizes. You're going to want to talk about what uh, card stock you're going to be printing on. You're going to want to talk about what kind of finish you're going to be printing on. Some of this is stuff that you can talk to the manufacturer about, especially the manufacturer is going to send you a sample kit that's going to say, here's all these things. And you're going to say, oh, I like the way this card feels. This is the one I want. And then they're going to price that for you. So you need to know sizes, finishes, types. These are things that you can work with the manufacturer, but you need to get this down. And the more you have before you talk to the manufacturer, the better off you're going to be and the better results you're going to get. So really figure out what it is that you want. You can, of course, uh, quote for options, right? So you can say, well, I want to quote this with generic wood cubes, and I also want to quote it with custom meeples or something, right? Um, you know, you can, you can talk about that, but also you're not going to approach and say, here's 20 different variations, right? Think about a couple of things. You can also talk to the manufacturer about ways to save money. Um, again, these, these people do this professionally, and their role is going to be helping you make the best thing. Uh, so we've made the game. We feel good. We've got our production sample. We go into full production. Now we need to figure out how to get that game to uh, either a warehouse and or consumers, right? You did a Kickstarter. You're going to do a lot of direct to consumer delivery. You uh, are almost always going to be doing some sort of warehousing, whether that warehousing is your basement or, you know, a big, big uh, warehouse company. So uh, international freight logistics is incredibly boring and incredibly complicated. Uh, have someone help you with it. If you are not good at it, you don't know about it already, have someone help you. 
Uh, a lot of factories will help you with that. Um, there are also outside uh, freight logistics companies like OTX. Um, they will manage that for you. There's a bunch of different codes that you don't need to worry about until it comes up, but familiarize yourself with this enough so that you can have a conversation with the professional that you are talking with. And again, be aware of if it's international, who's responsible for customs, who's responsible for different fees that may be associated with that international process. Uh, something that right now specifically is super relevant is that uh, due to COVID and due to a uh, large scale factory shutdown over time, uh, uh, boats are incredibly uh, delayed because there's only so many container ships in the world. They're really, these things are huge. They're, they're, they take a ton of money to make, a ton of time. There's only so many of them in the world. And because there was an interruption in the supply chain, uh, the boats are all backed up because you can run a factory three shifts, right? You can, you can ramp up production speed on making stuff again but you can't make more boats that quickly. And so there's just a real limit there. There are frequently, and this is actually true of all of this, especially in this manufacturing process, but also in that creative process, there are bottlenecks. And we wanna be aware of bottlenecks and try to work through those and around those and identify where those bottlenecks are and make sure that we are widening those as much as possible and that we have other ways to approach things and that we're able to move through those. Um, you also want to think about uh, your warehousing, how many games you have. Uh, is your garage now going to be full of stuff? Um, you also want to think about fulfillment, right? If you do a Kickstarter that's small, maybe you're going to fulfill that all yourself. Um, if you do a Kickstarter that's very successful, you're probably not going to. If you are going to do continued sales, are you going to be the one who is managing that? Or are you going to warehouse with a company that can do fulfillment for you, right? So you may say, hey, I'm going to send you a pallet of games and then orders are going to go to you and you're going to fill those orders and you know, I'm going to pay you, you know, two bucks, three bucks, uh, four bucks to, to do the pick and pack, put it in the packaging and then mail that off. Um, so, again, thinking about someone has to do that and who is going to be doing that. Um, man, we are we are flying through time here. So, man, a whole thing that is important to understand is the way games are sold. Um, so the hobby game industry specifically, but also just a lot of other industries as well, um, you have what we refer to as a three-tiered system. So the three tiers are manu you know, the publisher, manufacturer, the, the people who are making the game. Then you have the uh, distribution tier, and these are people that the publisher is going to interface with. This is typically going to have, they're going to have their own warehouses, they're going to have their own thing, and then the distributor is going to sell games to the retailer. Um, there are absolutely instances where, as a publisher, you will sell direct, direct to retailers. There are also instances, of course, where, as a publisher, you will sell direct to consumers, um, whether that's via website, whether that's via booths, um, you know, things like that. Um, but typically, especially at the larger scale, things are going to be done in this three-tier system. I personally am a huge fan of disrupting that uh, that path. But if you're operating at a certain level, you know, you're, you're generally going to be put into this. Um, as a retailer, something that's really important is that most retailers are not interested in taking chances on too many games. There are literally thousands of games that came out this year, even with COVID. Um, I, as a retailer, only have so much shelf space. And, well, you know what? I'm going to put uh, more Catan on the shelf than a game that maybe is going to sell. Maybe it isn't. Uh, if a game becomes a hit after it, I can typically get more. And if I can't get more, well, there's always another game that I can use to fill that space. So it is super difficult to earn shelf space in a retail store. Um, there is only so much of it, and you really need to, 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 to sell yourself. This is where distribution comes in uh, very helpfully. So as a publisher, you're going to say, well, I don't want to sell you games at less than a case. And, you know, I got to charge shipping and, you know, all this stuff because it costs money. To, I'm not going to send you one game at 50 percent off and I pay the shipping because then I didn't make any money. However, as a if I'm if I'm a retailer and I'm dealing with a distributor, I can buy one or two copies of a game. I can try something out. I can take a chance on something that I think is maybe interesting, is maybe, you know, this could be cool. I personally like it. I want it to do well, but I'm not going to commit to, you know, a, a case of it necessarily. And I'm certainly not going to pay shipping on it because now my margin is lower and my margin is more difficult. Um, speaking of margins, typically what's going to happen is that the publisher will sell the game into distribution for 40% of what that MSRP, the manufacturer suggested retail price. So I'm gonna sell you a game, I'm gonna sell it direct to consumer at $20. This is a $20 game. 
I am going to sell that to distribution. Actually, let's make it a ten dollar game. Easier math. So it's a ten dollar game. I'm going to sell that to a distributor for four dollars. That distributor is then going to sell that game to a retail store for somewhere around five dollars. Um, but I'd say five dollars to five fifty. So you're going to get uh, games into retailers' hands for let's say fifty uh, percent of that that cost. So I paid five dollars for it. But now the five dollars I'm making on that game has to pay for any associated costs with just getting that game, operating a shop, having the lights, paying electricity, paying staff, paying for marketing the store, paying for trying to you know grow our customer base. So that five dollar profit gets eaten away really quickly. Um, so it's important that we're going to kind of squeeze pennies wherever we can. We're going to try to be as, uh, you know, streamlined as possible. And again, I can sell a lot of D and D books. Um, I can sell a lot of, you know, Asmodee top 40. I know that these are things that are going to sell. I'm never really going to be stressed out about potentially over ordering settlers of Catan, right? I'll, I'll get through it. You know, there's maybe a cash flow issue, not optimized, but really, I'm going to sell it, right? Where, oh, I took 20 copies of this new card game that somebody made. Those can sit on my shelf for a very long time and then not turn into money. And now I've risked it, right? So if you're a publisher thinking about it, you really got to think about what the value is that you're presenting to people. If you're a retailer, you really got to think about your turn rate, the value that you're getting out of something, right? Dice, I'm always going to sell dice. And you know what? Dice don't take up a lot of space in the store. So I can have a ton of dice. So I'm going to look at my square footage that's being taken up by dice. And I'm going to say, how much money am I making per square footage? Uh, generally speaking, the best thing that you're going to have in game retail is magic. Magic takes up very little space and sells pretty well. Uh, if you didn't know. Um, so again, if your game is bigger, it needs to earn its space. If your game is smaller, it needs to earn its space. This is again, where visual design is hugely important because people are going to look at that visual design. That's what's going to jump off a shelf. That's what's going to make people happy. Um, Whoa. There are also distribution consolidators, uh, like a PSI. And so they're actually going to take the games from the publisher. They are then going to service multiple distributors. So again, distributors have this huge risk. They're going to buy how many games, and then they have to try to sell those to retailers. And well, I'm a retailer. I'm not looking for new stuff necessarily. I'm not necessarily going to be chasing down all the hot new things you brought in because you brought in a hundred games this month. I, I don't know which ones are great. So PSI allows distributors to do that same kind of piecemeal. Well, we'll bring in a few and we'll see what happens. I don't need to bring in a whole pallet of something, right? Um, and distribution consolidators, again, they're going to warehouse stuff. They can do your direct to consumer. They can do your servicing of distributors. They are going to kind of operate as, again, another middle person kind of helping grease the wheels, get stuff done. Um, one of the things that we're not going to get into in great depth here, and that is like sort of marketing. Um, marketing is an entire thing that people have entire degrees, uh, doing. So marketing is really complicated. It's very difficult to do well. Um, I suggest hiring a professional, um, if you are going to be a publisher, um, even if that professional is, you know, like for a small consultation, but, you know, make sure that you have someone who knows how to set up, um, your uh, Google Analytics and you know your Facebook Pixel and understands the idea of remarketing and audience segmentation and you know all of these things that are going to pay for themselves if you do it well. Um, so don't skimp on marketing. There is a huge amount of effort that goes into marketing um, in the digital space, especially, but even in the um, traditional sort of meat space, right? Think about your return on investment for conventions. Uh, conventions, I typically think of if we can make money, that's great. But if we break even, that's also great um, because I am getting the game out there. I'm building buzz, building um, excitement, being able to show the game to people. The nature of tabletop is that it's a physical industry. So the more opportunities I have to be physical with someone, the better. Um, at some point in this process of marketing, if it's earlier because you're doing a Kickstarter, you're doing it later, you're going to be interfacing with reviewers and things like that. Um, if you are interested in being a reviewer, talk to people about it, um, start doing things, you know, working up a body of work that may be doing work for free, 
Um, don't do a lot of it, but you know, if you want to write some reviews on Board Game Geek, that's totally cool. Start, you know, professionalizing it, getting in that, uh, getting into that uh, mind space, building that body of work, building that experience. Um, but pretty quickly, start thinking about, at the very least, not necessarily getting paid, but being compensated with a game. Like, if a publisher doesn't want to send you a game, like, then don't do work. You're, you don't, don't don't just do work for free. Don't do marketing work for them. Like you're doing marketing work. You're trying to sell things for them. Whether or not you are getting paid by a publication, uh, maybe a website that's paying for reviewers to work, or the publisher is paying you even in a free copy um, to talk about the game. Uh, if you're a publisher, identifying reviewers that are worth talking to, you're going to be looking at their audience, not just numbers, but also who their audience demographically is. Does it get with the type of audience you're trying to reach? You know, what is their promotional process? Um, you may also work with people who are going to do content creation for you. They may not push that content, but you're going to have uh, people like, say, Tabletop Backer Party, where you can pay them money and they will generate like videos for you. Um, really great work. And you then have to pay to distribute that or you have built your audience. Um, Again, one of the best ways to build an audience is to just participate in the community, start getting involved, start showing stuff off, start talking to people. Giving more than you get, again, really gets you ahead of things. If you are a, a play tester that's involved, if you're a publisher that's running play tests, you're getting into the mix, you're helping people out, people are gonna wanna help you out in return and you're gonna start you know, developing these relationships. Um, tabletop industry in general is a super relationship focused industry. Um, <clears throat> despite it being really big and despite it making a lot of money, which is another pet peeve of mine, like the industry makes a lot of money. People make a lot of money. A ton of people make a living working in the industry. Like, is it, is it the, is, as, uh, you know, easy to get a job as say being a teacher? No, but this is like saying, Oh, there's no money in the music industry just because not everybody can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, Who's popular? I don't know. Someone popular in music. I only know weirdos. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, saying that there's no money in games is is crazy and annoying and just completely wrongheaded. Um, that said, you might not have a lot of money <laughs> to work with, so make sure that you're thinking about the ways to kind of maximize that money that you have. Um, there's continued support that's going to go on. This is going to be, um, you know, dealing with if you're a publisher, you know, replacing damaged uh, copies, uh, missing pieces in games, because even the best manufacturers, there's going to be a defect rate. Like anybody who says they have a zero defect rate is full of it. Um, so you're thinking about continued support. You're also going to be thinking about cash flow and how you're going to uh, move forward through this. Um, if you're a freelancer, you're going to be constantly chasing after uh, work. Oh, Lady Gaga. I saw that in the chat. That's a great one. Yep. Uh, not everyone could be Lady Gaga, um, but there's a lot of money to be made. Um, so we are like already way over time. Hopefully that gives you a good rough overview of the massive amount of steps that go on in the industry. I didn't even get into a whole bunch of other roles, which is, you know, sort of being a lawyer, doing business stuff, doing warehouse work. There are a ton of jobs in the industry that aren't necessarily like the marquee job. And you can still work in the industry and not necessarily be, you know, this huge brand name designer because ultimately there aren't that many. Uh, ultimately, there are only so many huge publishers, but, you know, you can get in the industry, whether that's at a smaller scale and meets the goals that you have there, or you can work for a big company. You know, Asmodee has a ton of employees. Wizards of the Coast has a ton of employees. You can go work at these companies and be involved in the game industry uh, without necessarily doing the like, well, I have ideas. Like nobody just has ideas, right? Um, so there are a ton of roles, a ton of jobs, so many things that go into making a game. Each one of these elements that I talked about, even the ones I talked about for like two minutes, you can run not just an entire seminar on, but an entire college level course on how this works. Some of these, again, include entire degrees. So, you know, this is stuff that you're not necessarily going to pick up 
really easily. Think about where you want to be. Think about what you want to learn and, you know, try these things out. Find a space that's going to be exciting to you. Find a space that's going to <clears throat> meet your goals. Maybe you don't care about all this other stuff. You just want to make some games that are for fun. And maybe you're in a Kickstarter, print a couple hundred copies. That's awesome. Don't follow advice on how to be a bigger publisher. Like really think about what it is that you want to do. If some of the stuff I'm talking about sounds like an absolute nightmare, then it probably is. Don't worry about it. Do something that doesn't do that. Um, great. So I'm going to stick around, even though technically we're done, let's do some, uh, Q and a, as I said, uh, prepare your Q and a a little bit. Don't ask questions that are super personal, ask questions that you think are going to be broadly applicable. And again, think about the scope of this talk. Um, think about the things I did talk about, ask questions to expand on that, not, Hey, uh, you know, how do I count cards for this project? Like that's a whole different thing. And I'm happy to talk to you about it, but just not now. Um, cool. So hit us with questions. Yeah, I'm going to throw some questions in the chat up on the screen here. And the first is from Laura Irwin, Designing Games. How do you go about getting an agent? And is there a website or a goal for that? Yeah, so um, getting an agent is uh, complicated. And when I say that agents are common, I mean in a, a still on a small scale. Um, so I suggest uh, a, asking about it in the tabletop mentorship uh, chat, where some of us may be able to recommend a few people to reach out to. Um, and then I would ask in some other communities or groups to see what they recommend as well. Um, you can also look online. Um, <clears throat> but again, getting an agent is kind of a, a, a dicier situation because there are a lot of people that want to be agents and don't necessarily have the chops to do so. Um, there's also a whole complicated a uh, series of questions about whether or not you want to go exclusive with an agent, what the deal is with an agent, how that all shakes out. Um, so I think my answer is ask uh, in not this forum, like right now, and we'll talk about it in greater detail because there is so much more to be said about that. But that's a that's an excellent question. Uh, how do we feel about sending copies to reviewers, influencers for marketing? I think it's awesome. I think it's great. Um, I think it's a crucial part of the the steps in making a game. Um, I think even at a small scale, if you want other people to play your game, you got to let them know that it exists. But really think about who your audience is. Think about how you can target that audience. Think about the niche you're going to operate in. <clears throat> and then partner and reach out with people that are going to be natural fits for that. Um, think about people that are going to talk about games that are the type of game you're doing. Um, <clears throat> be cautious. Uh when people are looking for money, but also be cautious when people are complete amateurs, right? You want to kind of figure out the fit for what it is you're doing. Um, but absolutely getting the game out in front of people is, is generally going to be crucial no matter what tier you're looking to operate at. I mean, you want people talking about it. Um, I think influencers in general are widely undervalued and widely underappreciated uh, overall in the industry. Um, but you don't have to go after some of these like handful of like bigger names. Um, frequently, you're going to get lost in the shuffle there. Think about people you want to work with and partner with and that are, you know, it's going to be a mutually beneficial thing. They're going to get to talk about this game that's rad that their audience is interested in. You're going to have access for them talking about <clears throat> uh, a game that is two people that are going to maybe be interested in it. You know, the bottom line is that there's always a market for your niche. It's just maybe a very small niche but you're gonna to try to find out how to connect with those people, which is really marketing as a whole, right? Is not selling people stuff they don't need or don't want. It's presenting something that these people are going to be interested in, or at least likely to be interested in and getting it in front of them. Uh, cool. Is it possible to get comparable costs going with US or European printers when you factor in fulfillment shipping? Absolutely. Um, but there are so many other factors that may go into this. So first of all, I will say that um, printing in Europe, especially in Poland is my primary example, but especially uh, some of the other places in Europe, the cost is going to be comparable to China, um, especially when you factor in all these other things. But again, you're looking at quality, you're looking at where your primary market is, you know? So of course, if you're printing in the US, it's gonna be cheaper to get that game to wherever it's going in the US, but maybe the US is a little bit more expensive because it doesn't have uh, labor rates that are comparable, which is a whole complicated, like uncomfortable conversation that, that, I, uh, that we should all be having, uh, whether or not we want to, we should be really be thinking about compensation. 
um, for all jobs and you know what sort of uh, market and process we're we're participating in. Um, but ultimately, it's going to go project to project, right? You can do a small card game in a tuck box for a very comparable price when you factor in everything uh, here in the U.S. Also, the scale is going to be important. Uh, the U.S. is generally going to have higher per uh, per print run minimums. But once you get up into these larger print run sizes is going to potentially be very comparable. Um, you also have to think about speed, which is not just it's not just a pure money calculation, right? If I can turn this game around quicker, maybe I'm going to make more money because I am able to turn this game around quicker. Am I able to do reprints quicker? Um, I've had experiences where when I was uh, just really quick when I was manufacturing, um, I can tell you that uh, code names could not keep up. When code names first kind of dropped and exploded, they literally, literally could not print enough code names fast enough. Um, and so there were efforts made to partner with other factories. There was efforts made to look at even if it was going to be more expensive per unit to print in the U.S., the amount of sales that were being lost by not having product quickly enough, um, it was worth it to pay more money potentially to get it printed in a place where it was going to be delivered quicker. Um, so again, ultimately what you're going to want to do is quote your project out with a variety of people um, and companies and look at not just the per unit cost, look at the holistic landed cost, and then also be looking at the holistic, you know, production of the game overall and what you may or may not be getting out of printing in one region over another. Uh, how realistic is it for me to come in with my own artist? Um, that is going to be completely dependent on the artist. Um, generally speaking, that's not going to happen very often. That's uh, frequently going to be uh, something that as a publisher throws up something of a red flag. Um, certainly not a deal stopper, but it's definitely something where it's like, oh, well, if I don't like this art, like, are you going to be difficult to work with? How much money did you spend on this art potentially beforehand? Um, are you a designer that hired an artist to do this art? You know, what's the complication if I don't like the art? Um, if I don't like the artist, you know, um, as I said, uh, visual design is crucially important now. But again, the tiers at which you're operating at, the scale, the companies, they're going to have different feelings about it. Um, some, especially smaller publishers, especially publishers that are maybe more Kickstarter driven, are going to look at that as a benefit. Um, larger publishers are maybe going to look at that as a detriment and something that they just don't care about. Um, it's really going to be specific, although I would say the norm is not going to be bringing in an artist. I see that you're updating this note that the artist is your wife. That's going to certainly make it uh, less uh, less of a weird red flag because you're working on this thing together. Uh, but it also raises a concern of, well, I really like the design, but I think the art sucks. Uh, and now like, ooh, like I don't want to, I like this design, but I'm going to tell you that your wife's art isn't cool. Uh, like what is that going to, you know, look like. Um, but ultimately, I think that the, the most important thing to, to keep in mind through all this is that um, not everything is for everyone. Uh, taste is taste. And, you know, just because somebody doesn't like something doesn't mean that it's bad. It just might not fit into what it is that they're trying to do or the vision they may have for it. Um, and that if you can't take criticism, uh, this is not <laughs> doing creative work is not a great space to be in. Uh, that said, if somebody's a dick, uh, you can tell them to go fuck themselves uh, because nobody should be uh, rude about it. Um, you know, even if they don't like the thing, even if it's, you know, they're like, wow, this is really bad. Like, there's no reason for them to be uh, rude and, 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 and mean about it. Uh, seems like we might be out of question. Yeah, I think that's all the questions that have come in. Uh, thank you so much, man. That was incredibly comprehensive for a very ambitious talk topic, honestly. <laughs> time. Yeah, well, like I said, if you have more questions, um, you know, absolutely throw them in the Discord. Um, there's only so much typing that any of us are, are capable of doing at any given time. But, you know, far beyond just myself, there are a lot of really, really incredibly talented people in there. There are literally people who uh, I saw our mentors, some of whom I uh, are friends that I helped bring in. And I'm like, man, I want to get mentored by this person. Like, forget me being a mentor. There's some amazing people in here that I want to hear from. Um, there's absolutely people that are really, really smart. They're going to disagree with 
every single every single opinion that I have presented in this, someone that is really smart, really talented, really accomplished is going to have an excellent reason why I'm wrong. Um, and and that's that I think is a, a wonderful thing. And healthy discussions about this is great. But definitely lean on the community. One of the things that I think we really really um, have it have it wonderfully here in the tabletop industry as a whole is that people are just absolutely wonderful by and large um and if you run into somebody who's a jerk fuck them there's so many more people that aren't um and you know just people want to help each other people are excited and i can say this even uh i've been personally making more moves into the toy industry so i've known people you know hasbro etc for for years and years but but some of these companies i'd never met before and i'm starting to talk to more i'm pitching actual toys not just games even at this highest echelon um, dealing with creative people or people that work with creatives, everyone's wonderful. It's awesome, right? Like, you know, it, the, the, the person who is doing toy intake for Spin Master it, it, or, or Mattel, they're wonderful people. They're great. They're excited. They, they are in this because they like what they do. Uh, you may run into like a lawyer or a business person that's kind of like not as, not as chill, uh, but, but by and large, everybody's cool uh, or 99% of people are cool and there are just so many wonderful conversations to be had. And again, grain of salt with everybody, even, even me, me more than anyone, just everybody, uh, you know, really, really, you know, just get advice, talk to people, get help. We all want to help people. Um, more better games helps all of us. Um, you know, it's, it's better for all of us. How many people do you know that bought one game, right? Nobody buys one game. So if they, if you, if I can help make you make an amazing game, and you sell that to somebody, that's going to help me sell more games. That's going to help me make more games because it's it's really a rising tide situation. Um, I see one more question last minute here. Yeah, this this final one with uh, following that seam of encouragement maybe. Yeah, the answer is totally, absolutely. It is totally possible to go in cold turkey with no experience and get a game published on its own virtue. It is I'm not going to lie. It's a tougher, tougher, you know, step. You're going to, you're going to grind it out. You know, um, it, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of commitment. Sometimes it takes sacrifice. Um, my general advice on this is that no matter what, it's going to take luck to be successful. It's going to take luck, especially early on to make stuff happen, but we have to make our own luck. We have to be there. We have to be willing to make the effort and the sacrifices, um, be willing to prioritize things in a way that are important. So for myself, um, I live a very sort of punk rock life. Um, I do not want kids or have kids. I have chosen to put uh, living a creative weirdo life above certain other things. And so I am able to I was able to create a situation where I could go to conventions and not make money and I could get on the circuit and grind it out. And not everybody has to follow that same path, but I can tell you that by uh, virtue of making choices in my whole life, I've been able to really uh, build a career because it's not super easy and it's not something where I'm just going to necessarily roll up to a booth and be like, hey, I have this great idea. And then boom, I'm a huge successful game designer. Um, not to say that that doesn't happen ever, but really, you know, it's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. And frequently, it's a lot of sacrificing and prioritizing, right? Something I tell my students, something I tell everybody in life, never say, I don't have the time. Just get out of the mindset of, I don't have the time to do this. The actual thing you're saying is, I am not willing to prioritize this over certain other things in my life. And there is nothing wrong with that. And that's wonderful. But take that step back and really think about what it is that you are doing in your life, right? Um, obviously, you know, capitalism in America is not the coolest uh, in, in the way that is. And so, of course, there are barriers that we're going to be trying to overcome as a society. There's a community of people that are trying to help and, and get people over those humps. But generally speaking, if you're like, well, I can't go to enough conventions because, you know, I can only try, I only have so many vacation days, you know, and I got to do this other stuff. And I always go to the Bahamas every year, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but you're prioritizing things in a different way, right? Every trip that I have taken for, or, well, let me say 90% of the trips I've taken over the last 10 years have been going to game conventions and usually working and not, but still coming out of it at the end, not really having much money made at that convention. That is a wonderful privilege that I have, but that is something where I have prioritized 
doing things in a certain way. So absolutely you can, you can cruise up and, and, you know, break through and do the thing, but it's luck. And the more opportunities you are giving yourself to create that luck, the more uh, chances you're going to be there, the more opportunities you're going to have to, to, to make that happen. Um, oh man, I see a whole bunch of, uh, whole bunch of, a whole bunch of chat. Here. Yeah, everybody's joining in the discourse on uh, on what it takes to get started, and is it a problem to start with a big game first, or you know, following the industry advice of jumping in with something smaller? Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, if anybody's telling you don't do the thing you're doing, fuck them. Like, get up. That's the answer. Because there are always exceptions to everything. There's always things we can point to that are outliers. If you are satisfied with what you're doing, if you are, are doing what you want to be doing, you're feeling creative, creatively fulfilled or financially fulfilled or whatever these things are, only you know the right path forward. And, and never let anybody tell you that what you're doing is wrong. That said, people may have wonderful advice on how to maximize your opportunities, how to best get to the place that you want to be. And that may not include it's not going to be awesome the whole time. <laughs> it's not going to be the easiest thing, but fuck them, man. Take the path you want to take. Everybody can get to a place, look at where you want to be and look at, you know, the ways to optimize your steps to get there. And for a lot of people, especially at the, you know, hobby side thing, you're not looking for a career. So make it fun. Have a good time. Like, like set some goals, make a game that's awesome. And maybe it doesn't break out. Maybe it doesn't get huge. Maybe you're not, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. So much advice is based around how to build up this big company. Well, maybe you don't want that, right? Have fun. Be the bar band, right? Be, be just playing with your friends, making stuff. Like if you're satisfied, make it. Um, I see this don't start on big games. Fuck it. If you are excited about a big game and you feel like you're going to put a lot of effort and energy and heart and soul into making this bigger game, then that's awesome. You know what the first game Isaac uh, Childress uh, blew? Well, I guess he did one other game first, didn't he? Um, but you know what? Like, oh, don't do Gloomhaven, right? Like, well, okay, cool. Like, oh, you know, Gloomhaven, it's so big. Like, blah, blah, blah. like no, like the, he didn't work in the industry and design dozens and dozens of games before he decided to make Gloomhaven, right? And so, like, there's always outliers to everything. And maybe you're one of those outliers. You know, there's ways to, to optimize your luck. There's ways to maybe, like, play the the odds in some way but you know be excited and everyone that's in here that's talking about game design you are a game designer you are 100 percent a game designer have you designed a game great is it finished doesn't matter is it good doesn't matter is it published doesn't matter you are a game designer you might suck and you might have a long way to go before you get there but everybody started with some terrible nonsense everybody started on this process and wherever you are in this process like don't let anybody like bring you down or say that you're not, you know, doing whatever because you're doing the thing. It's awesome. Enjoy it. Enjoy the journey. Like this is this is great. Have fun with it. Hell yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> That is a great note to leave on. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. This was the first time we've done the speaker series, so we're excited, Matt. Thank you for all of that wisdom and energy and fuck them energy as well. You know, <laughs> I, tried, I tried so hard to not curse through the whole regular presentation. So far. And then I got worked up at the end. Uh. <laughs> the big finale, you know? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, just, you know, like ask questions in the in the tabletop mentorship chat. I think that Grace and Mike have done such an incredible thing here and built this really amazing community and, you know, get involved and talk to people and, you know, have a good time with it. Yeah. So ways to stay involved, folks. We have um, we're going to do a live talk like this every two weeks. And then in between them, we have partnered with Tabletop Network and New Voices in Gaming to put this whole series together. And so on our off weeks, we are releasing a talk from the Tabletop Network vault. So next week, we will be releasing Designing with a Story Focus by Ryan Lockett. And then the week after that, we have a live presentation from Banana Chan, how to get started writing in games. Oh man, you are absolutely crushing it. Everyone who is here, you are totally fucking up if you don't come to that. Um, <laughs> that is that is awesome. Fun side note, uh, Banana and I did our first LARP ever, ever together. Oh my gosh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. It was a very bizarre experience. <laughs> Started at midnight at a convention. <laughs> As the best LARPs do, I presume. 
I mean, uh, it's it's incredible to see uh, how amazing the work they're doing in that space is, uh, and to think that we had this bizarre experience together at this convention, and it was it was great. But yeah, Banana is absolutely brilliant designer doing incredible work. So please, please, please make sure that you uh, you make it to that. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and put up the title card for that so that you all can mark that on your calendars if you like. Thank you again, Matt. Uh, if you all have any more questions, uh, check out our Discord and we will see you again in the future. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, awesome. Bye everybody, thank you.